Hey, YouTube theologians, a Sunday drive home. Um, today, ooh, ooh, today, Genesis chapter 3, the fall into sin. What an absolute... Wah. I wrote a good sentence once, one time. I think this was in the book, Has American Christianity Failed? I think I've written like five good sentences in my life. And, uh, you know, this. Pro I don't even think this was a good sentence. It was just a good phrase. Uh, the whole sentence wasn't that good, but this phrase was good, is that the sound of the, of the fruit in the garden, the sound of Adam and Eve biting into the fruit was the sound of the back of the universe breaking. That was a, that's an all right sentence. But that is, Adam and Eve, oh man, just the tragedy of the whole thing. And we might miss it because when Adam and Eve eat the fruit, it says that um, they saw that they were naked and they were ashamed and were like, well, it doesn't seem like they realized that now the stars would explode and now there'd be coronavirus outbreaks and that the whole kind of unfolding tragedy of human drama was going to result from this. But anyway... All that realization is there in the seeing their own nakedness and, and going to make the fig leaves. But remember the fig leaves are the picture. The fig leaves are the stand-in for the, for the human religion. Remember the fig leaves. The, the fig leaves are the answer to the question, Adam and Eve's question, how can I cover the shame of my own nakedness? And we see in that question the thought that they could do it. And we even, it even looks like they, they thought that they succeeded. They're there with the fig leaves covering their shame and until they hear the sound of God. And then they think, oh boy, now we're in trouble. They, these fig leaves are not enough and they run and they hide. But here's the thing that I'm hooked into. I just, I haven't been able to escape this what this means, meditating on this for the last few months. So the devil comes and to tempt Eve, and there's probably four or five moves that the devil makes as he tempts Eve. The first is to put a question mark into where there should be no question, to cause Eve to start to question and doubt God's word. So the devil says, did God really say you're not supposed to eat any of these trees? Which is ridiculous. I mean, God had said, you guys got to eat all of the trees except for one. In fact, the Lord said, you shall freely eat. I didn't notice it until this week. In the Hebrew, there's this, what did Andy tell me this morning? It's the infinitive construct or something. There's a name for it. There's a way that the, when the Hebrew wants to amplify something, they'll say the word twice. So when the Lord says, for example, after he created Eve and gave her to Adam as his wife and looks at him and he says, it's very good. Well, there's, it doesn't, if you look at the Hebrew, it doesn't say very good. It says, tov, tov, good, good, a double good, like a, a compounded good. That's how the, that's how the Hebrew language kind of has this sort of, it, it, it amplifies the thing. Well, the, this, the same thing is there for the eating. It says, the, the, Sorry, this guy doesn't know that I want to go that way. Uh, in the, it says it in the Hebrew, it says, uh, eating you will eat. There's a double eating there. In other words, and sometimes we say, surely you shall eat of any of the trees, or freely you shall eat from any of the trees. In other words, there's this kind of abundance of eating that's supposed to take place in the garden. And Eve misses it. When she reports back to the devil, says the Lord had said, you may eat, but not, you may surely eat. You may, you may feast. In other words, the Lord said, you can feast on these, on all the other trees. And, uh, and Eve says, you can snack from all the other trees. That's the thing that's missing. So the first thing the devil does is he, is he gives a question mark. Okay. Now, speaking of snack, I'll be right back. There's, there's two or three other things uh, moves that the devil makes. So the first is to put a question mark. Did God really say? And then he goes out and just says, God's word's wrong. You will not surely die. He calls God a liar. And then the last move he makes, not the third move, because I want to come back to that. 
the last move that the devil makes is he replaces God's truth with his own lie. And a peculiar thing, he says, uh, he says, uh, on the day that you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, notice how, and this is very interesting, how the devil, um, he doesn't just outright lie, but he mixes the truth of God with a lie. So God had already made Adam and Eve like him. Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, in the, in the likeness of God. They already had that. So the devil picks up that license of God but says, you will be like God. In other words, you're not like him now. And then the devil says, you will have the knowledge of good and evil. Well, they already had the knowledge of good. In fact, they were. It was when God created Adam and Eve that he looked at the whole world and said, it's very good. So they already had that. So, that, so they're not going to gain the knowledge of good. They're just going to gain the knowledge of evil. But see how the devil mixes it in? He says, you will know good and evil. Okay, so, so move one, question God's word. Number two, deny God's word. Number four, replace God's truth with your own lie. But there's this middle move, and that is to impugn the motives of God. This is the tricky one. The devil comes along and he says, God knows that you will not surely die. Now that's incredible. It could be, and, and I think we've talked about this before. I'm still kind of pressing this through, but it could be that the devil could just as well have said to Eve, you will not surely die. On the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. It could have just been, that seems like that would have been enough. But that's not what the devil says. The devil says that God knows that on the day that you eat of it, <clears throat> there's a way that it would not have worked for the devil to just tie down Adam and Eve and pry their mouths open and stuff the fruit down it. In fact, I don't know, and this is maybe a little bit of speculation, but it seems like it's not even enough for, the, for Adam and Eve just even to eat the fruit. That, that, the, that the devil is really after Adam and Eve's unbelief. You know, like, if they would have just been, like he could have tricked them and confused them and they're just walking along and, and they, don't, they come at the tree from the backside, they don't recognize it, they accidentally eat it, that wouldn't have been enough. They have to intentionally be rejecting God and God's goodness and God's provision and God's mercy and God's love. Excuse me. So that the devil comes along and he says, God knows that you will not surely die. The devil, the devil wants to convince Adam and Eve that God has ulterior motives. That the reason why the Lord said that they're not supposed to eat the fruit is not for their own good, but for his good. As if as if God is not planting Adam and Eve in the garden and giving them all these gifts because he truly loves them, but because rather he gets some sort of amusement from them or, or because that, 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 that God wants to protect his own whatever, his likeness and his throne, and he doesn't want Adam and Eve to be part of it. So, Adam, so, so that God has <clears throat> tried to keep Adam and Eve down. <clears throat> And that's what the commandment is. It's a form of oppression. So the devil impugns God's motives. And how often does this happen to us? I better get in front of this guy. That the devil comes along and he tries to say, look, you're, you, 
you want to do this thing, I want you to do this thing. It's God who doesn't want you to do it, and he's the bad guy. He's the one who's trying to keep you from being free, from living your full life, from enjoying this world to its full potential. God has ulterior motives. He's given you these commandments not because he loves you, but because he hates you, or he doesn't like you, or he just likes to see you suffer, or whatever. <clears throat> There's something amazing that happens in the temptation of Jesus. It's the first temptation that is reported to us. Do you remember Jesus is out in the woods for 40 days and 40 nights, not eating. And the text, as someone said this morning, master of understatement, the text says he was hungry. You know? And the devil comes along and he says, why don't you turn this rock into a piece of bread? It doesn't even have to be fancy bread, you know? You don't have to make it like some sort of woven French loaf. Just make it, make it a little tortilla or something. Just a little bite to eat. Nobody will know the difference. No one's going to miss this rock. We're out here in the sticks. If you are the Son of God, that's what he said when you were baptized. If you're God's Son, why don't you just... Why don't you do this? Now, what's amazing is that Jesus... When there was 5,000 people starving out in the wilderness, Jesus is able to make bread for everybody. It's not a problem. He could do it. But, he, but he's, it's not his office to use his power for his own benefit. <laughs> and there's a similar dynamic that's there in the Garden of Eden that the devil's trying to tempt Adam and Eve to think that they are just simply there for God's own amusement. <clears throat> that there's no true self-giving, no true love from God to his creation. That it's self-serving. The devil's always trying to make God self-serving. Trying to convince us that God acts like the devil acts. Well, I don't know. I'm interested if, if you guys have thoughts on this. The, the, um, this particular little phrase in the devil's tempting of Adam and Eve where he says, God knows that you will not die. By the way, people say, well, the, was the devil right? Because Adam and Eve ate the fruit and they didn't die. But this is one of the confusions. When Eve repeats back to the devil uh, the restriction that God had put in place, there's three things that she gets, that she gets wrong. She's befuddled already by the devil, it seems. And she takes one thing away, she adds one thing, and she changes one thing. The thing she takes is, takes away is the freely eating. We mentioned that before. She turns it to the snacking or to just eating, not the abundant eating. And the thing she takes away or the thing she adds is the touch. We shouldn't eat it or even touch it. And then the thing that she changes is the is the <clears throat> is the threatening part. Eve says, we shouldn't eat it or, or, or touch it lest we die, as if the fruit itself were poison. That's not what God said. The Lord said, on the day that you eat of it, dying you will die. There's a double death there. It says in the English, surely you will die, but that's the same sort of phenomenon. It's this repeated dying, you de double death. And so there'll be a spiritual death and there'll be a physical death. And so they, uh, even as they're deciding to eat, even as they're rejecting God's word and believing the word of the devil, they're already spiritually dead. And we see it in the fact that not only do they see that they're naked and they try to cover them themselves with leaves, the fig leaves, but also that when they hear the sound of the Lord in the garden, they run. That is the picture of spiritual death. Running, instead of running to the sound of the Lord in the garden, running from the sound of the Lord in the garden. They think again the Lord is after them to get them. But look at what the Lord does. He comes along and he says, okay, now you guys have eaten the fruit, so it's true you're going to have to die, but now I'm on a rescue mission. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He'll crush your head, he'll crush his heel. And so the Lord puts into place this war that will culminate in the death of Jesus. 
and the destruction of the devil by the death of Jesus. So beautiful. That's the first gospel, by the way, the Proto-Evangelion, this beautiful preaching. Adam and Eve could have basically confessed the Apostles' Creed after this promise. It's so wonderful. And Adam and Eve believe it. In fact, I don't. there's a lot of little kind of hidden secret indications that Adam and Eve believe the promise, including the what Eve says when Cain's born. But I think one of the coolest is what Adam names Eve. If it would have been me, I'm just trying to think if, okay, I'm Adam and now Eve, I'm still mad at her because of this whole fall business and eating the fruit and I've got to give her a name and I'd probably give her the name death or trouble or consternation or temptation or fall or something. But Adam calls her Eve, which means life. <laughs> How wonderful is that? Life, because she's the mother of all the living. Because from her will come the life of the world. From the seed of the woman, the head of the serpent will be crushed. <laughs> That's wonderful. Oh, God be praised. Sunday drive.